Hey, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to our, our webinar today. Uh, MPAC is providing you uh, various leaders throughout our community and throughout the nation to discuss uh, responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we have uh, healthcare experts, we have policy experts. Uh, we're also tracking legislation, not only on the stimulus package, but um, also on uh, other uh, areas such as law enforcement and Department of Justice regulations and transparency. There's something that's happening coming down the line that you should be aware of uh, where certain powers are, are going to be expanded, uh, not only um, at the street level, but also in the courts uh, that may violate and compromise civil liberties. So we're keeping an eye out on that for you. Uh, we're also involved in the Launch Good campaign uh, for relief uh, to those who are uh, dealing with this crisis day to day, paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and while big business is uh, going to be taken care of, uh, the average family, the average person is, is not. Uh, and so we have to continue advocating uh, to relieve uh, our country from this inequity. Uh, today, our, our special guest, uh, and she's a very special person and a great leader in our community, Dr. Heather Laird Jackson, for the Center of Muslim mental health and Islamic psychology. And uh, she's been doing this way before uh, we've had to practice social distancing and, and isolation. Um, and, and, and she's been taking care uh, of those in need, um, and the mosques, the community, the families, individuals, and, and has been counseling uh, and organizing forums on mental health and mental well being uh, for our community. for for several years. So Heather, welcome. Good to see you again. Assalamu alaikum, thank you. <clears throat> Virtually, but uh, we're, we're, we're all connected. Yes. Alhamdulillah. So uh, tell us uh, about, uh, you know, before this, the Center for Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology to work, and then we'll talk about the current uh, situation. Well, the Center for Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology basically has three arms. We do community outreach, we um, conduct research, and we provide clinical services to individuals, uh, couples, and families, um, as well as we do community education. That's our main thrust. Yeah. And we've had, uh, you know, I, I, I was privileged to be uh, on the board for, for a short time. Unfortunately, I couldn't. Um, continue uh, because of bandwidth, uh, so many other issues happening within MPAC, and, but I apologize for that. Uh, but having said that, I, I was privileged to see the work from, uh, from the inside and the conference that you put on. And, and, and tell us about those conferences and the conclusions, recommendations that came from them. Well, um, so we really appreciate actually the time that you were on the board. You were very, very helpful. Um, and helping us progress and expand. So I really do appreciate that, Salam. Um, as far as the conference goes, we have the conference defining an Islamic psychology. And there were many conclusions in the first year and the second year. Uh, it's a conference we <clears throat> hope to hold annually. Although this year we decided to take a break and regroup um, and allow for others around the country to understand what we're doing. So we're doing one day seminars describing, you know, what the conference is about. But some of the conclusions that we reached were that there can be many Islamic psychologies uh, that are, as long as they are rooted in the Quran and Sunnah, right? So it, just like we have different madhabs, we can have uh, more than one viewpoint of an Islamic psychology, but that, uh, for our community's sake, is that we have like this spectrum of what we would call Muslim mental health, where you have, it's a much larger umbrella, where you have anybody who identifies as Muslim seeking mental health services. Um, that could be somebody who's culturally Muslim or you know somebody adhering to uh, more practicing um, regimen in their day. Uh, that, that would include everybody in that umbrella. Islamic psychology is more of the theoretical construct that addresses those people who want to get services that are more geared toward um, something that looks like it's in unison with their daily practice of Islam. 
So you, you can think of Islamic psychology being, you know, a part of that larger umbrella of Muslim mental health. You know, one of the stigmas that we have in our community is uh, addressing mental health. Um, how have you worked to remove that stigma? I know you've done a lot uh, on that front and, and to reframe the conversation so that it is part of practice vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Quran and the Sunnah. So what, what I, actually this is what I did my dissertation on, right? Um, I looked at if we could align Islamic values with, um, with uh, family systems theory, which is a perspective and approach to mental health. Uh, would this allow people to have a more positive attitude toward both psychotherapy uh, and seeking services? and also toward mental illness itself. And <clears throat> what we found was, <clears throat> excuse me, that yes, in fact, if I give a lecture to the community on this and they see how much they have in common in terms of their own cultural values and Islamic values with these theories, then they are more prone to um, going to seek services. Now, one of the things that I expose them to when I talk about family systems theory is genograms. And genograms allow us to look at our family history and the family patterns, both um, for things like heart disease and diabetes to relational patterns that can lead to furthering poor relationships. So for example, if a family has domestic violence in the family pattern, they're likely to continue that pattern but we can break that pattern by identifying it, which a lot of people would like to do. And so <clears throat> by showing people that we do these things like genograms, and we in our culture as Muslims have a lot of ibns, right? <laughs> We're always looking and proud to talk about our heritage. Um, that aligns very well with the way that we conceptualize the world. And so one thing that people said 100% in our study is if we offered genograms in the treatment, they would definitely be willing to come because it's, it, al it aligns very well with the way that we conceptualize the world um, and, and, our, and our family values. We, I'm sure many of our guests today uh, who are listening in have questions. So for those who are on, uh, on our uh, webinar right now, go ahead and type your questions uh, on the chat space and we'll go ahead and relate to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Laird Jackson, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue the conversation uh, with your comments and questions. Um, the other point uh, related to this crisis, Heather, is you know, anxiety in and of itself can, can compromise the immune system. So how can you, as, a, as an expert, as a, as a counsel, help people aid or guide themselves through this era and mitigate this problem of anxiety? So I'm glad you brought this up. Um, last night, I was uh, preparing, I, I had uh, a lot of clients last night and I was preparing to see one and I got a text message from my mother that my brother was in the ER and my heart sank, you know, and um, I, it was not for the COVID-19, but rather he thought he was having appendicitis. Mm -hmm. Regardless, he, you know, was there alone, right? And you're not allowed to go in with your family members at all if they go into the hospital. And it's something for people to really consider when they think about staying home or going out because you will be in the hospital alone. Um, and, and when you think about that, it's, it's quite anxiety f filling, right? Mm -hmm. um, Alhamdulillah, he's okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, I say that, give that little story to illustrate how fast and quickly people can feel anxiety. Anxiety, much like COVID-19, is, is contagious. So once people are feeling anxiety, it can grow and other people can feel their anxiety and it can, you probably even feel it as I'm talking about it now, uh, your own anxiety increasing. And so there are many ways that we can address anxiety. 
uh, both from the, and I think that anytime we think about addressing mental health issues, we want to really think on a dynamic perspective of, you know, both how do we address the individual, our family, and the community, and then also how do we address the biological symptoms, the psychological symptoms, the social symptoms, and the spiritual ones. So if we think spherically about all those different pieces, um, we can come out with a good outcome. Uh, so how we can do that is as an individual, right, we can do things that are less anxiety provoking. Because one thing we need to understand as a community about anxiety is that we need a little bit of it. We have to have a little bit of it to get out of bed in the morning. So anxiety is one of those things that we never fully cure people of having. You need a little bit to get going in the morning. And that's really important at this time when we think about maintaining routine. Because a lot of us are getting into more Ramadan schedules where we're staying up all night and getting up later in the day because we're at home. And um, you know that's, that's kind of traditional for a lot of people during Ramadan. But right now, in order for us to keep a good healthy outlook, we should really consider staying on routine, uh, forcing ourselves to stay on the regular routine we would have when we were leaving the house to go out to work. Um, so that's on the positive side. On another, an, an, another thing that we can do is to just watch the news less. Stay away from the news, you know, get, get the important information that you need, right. uh, and then turn it off. And that includes even on social media, um, because what we know from times past and, and currently, uh, people can actually take on vicariously things that they're viewing. So if you see, you know, pictures of uh, people's poor health or you see pictures of people dying, um, you know, I know they've been showing some, you know, pretty explicit pictures about, you know, all the, what they're doing with the dead in different parts of the world um, because there are so many people dying um, and that can be vicariously traumatic for people, uh, meaning that they feel the trauma that's occurring or the grief in this case that's occurring without being a part of it literally. Um, so that can be just as affecting psychologically as if you were there. And so we want to limit our exposure to that because we will all feel it. Um, another thing that we can do is to also, um, you know, proactively look at the things that we can do positively. So stay, when, we, when we learn about what we can do to safeguard ourselves, we can practice those um, you know, measures like washing our hands, like making sure that when we bring things into the house that they're sanitized. And we can also empower children um, while they're at home to teach them themselves how to carry out these measures and make decisions themselves, right? So we can help them learn how to be empowered too. Um, we can also, humor is a great way of dealing with anxiety, right? And so um, viewing comedy, laughing with friends, we can still connect via technology. One of the pro, you know, positive factors to technology, being able to connect with each other still um, and, and have a regular conversation with our friends like we would normally do. Um, make that chai, make that tea and, and have it over you know, Zoom, for example. We can also do things like um, guided imagery or um, deep relaxation. I'm actually uh, going to record today a progressive uh, deep relaxation and make it free for everybody to have um, so that they can use it as they will. Um, now for some people, uh, very few people, but for some people that can make them anxious, right? So you just have to listen to your body and if it makes you anxious, anxious you just stop. But for the, for the most uh, majority of people, it actually is very, very helpful and helping them not only relax, but also to sort of let the grief that they're feeling move through their body. Um, because a lot of what people are feeling in addition to anxiety right now is grief. Uh, there's a lot of grief. Um, and it has to do with not just human beings, but also 
sort of grieving their routine, the loss of their routine, the loss of their work, the loss of, you know, just loss, all right? And they may not identify it as grief as such because they're not used to thinking about it in that way. We're used to thinking about grief in terms of losing people, but we're not used to thinking about grief in terms of how it affects our daily life, you know, in terms of our routine or our system. We have a question from uh, one of our listeners. Uh, Mirza Bilal Beg is asking, is there anything you would recommend that we do every night before going to sleep or right after waking up to be on a more stress-free, stable, motivated mindset? Of course, and it depends on where you are and in your life. Um, of course, spiritually, we have all kinds of dua that you can make every night before you sleep to try to put your mind at ease and rest. Um, that certainly, you know, would be a good recommendation for those who, you know, are inclined to do so. Um, for those of you who may have not tried it before, maybe it's something you try for the first time. Um, but we also have other things like art therapy. Uh, so for example, we have something called a tangle, um, where you draw a line on a paper and then you it's kind of like doodling people are more familiar with calling it doodling um, and there's research that suggests that if you doodle or you color um, there's adult coloring books if you color for 20 to 25 minutes a day that you will improve um, insomnia you will be more relaxed when you go to sleep um, so those are two different things you can do dua and the art work you can also, um, you know, use your tespi and do dhikr. Um, there's research that suggests just rubbing the beads reduces anxiety. Um, it gives people more calm feeling. Uh, as well, if you're a person that thinks a lot, like you're, you work hard, like you do salam, um, and you have so much on your mind uh, in, that you're thinking about, you can write down on a piece of paper all those thoughts and put them on your nightstand to let them be for the night so they're there in the morning. Um, and you can pick them back up when you wake up, but that sometimes allows people enough space to relax and go to sleep. Um, there's also, you know, physical activity. Physical activity, for some people that's energizing and will wake them up, for other people uh, that helps to relax them to go to sleep. And then lastly, I would mention that if you are one of those people that has trouble going to sleep, uh, don't just lay in bed while you're not able to go to sleep. If you truly can't go to sleep, get back up, you know, either watch something on television that you would never watch that will be totally boring to you <laughs> or uh, read a book. Uh, a lot of people don't read, so that usually puts them to sleep, but do an activity where uh, it will make you drowsy so that you can and then go back to the bedroom and go to sleep. Um, so it's okay to get out of bed if you're not sleepy and until you can become sleepy. You know, the other thing that we're forced to do in our households right now is to have dinner together because we, you know, we're usually on the run, somebody's out, they're coming and going, <laughs> ships passing through the night. But, uh, you know, that's also an opportunity to, to build that uh, cohesion and and, and, and address some of the stress and, and talk about it at the dinner table. I, I think that's, that's something that we take for granted um, throughout the years. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Salam, because um, yes, a lot, we're finding that people are so much on the run and have so busy their lives that they're not used to being at home necessarily with their loved ones. And people being into this forced space of being present for one another has, um, for some people, it's brought them very close. And for other people, it's brought more conflict um, because they're not used to being around each other. Um, as such, actually, we recognize this because it has actually brought a lot of conflict for people. Uh, we are, on Sunday night, we're having a uh, webinar for couples um, to try to um, discuss the difficulties they're having and then look at ways to de-escalate um, when communication gets rough or um, tough uh, because really we have to stay home right now and there's not really a way of avoiding each other 
And if you're not used to being around each other, yes, it's an opportunity for connection. Um, and we have to, sometimes, sometimes people are not used to doing that. So they need some help in how, how to do it better. What about practicing social distancing in the household? Um, there are some cases I hear where couples are now in separate rooms, separate, like they're trying to keep their distance. Um, how do you address that? I mean, you're trying to achieve the balance. Are you saying that in a, a positive health. way or? No, no. Well, you know, not for me, but uh, maybe for others. But uh, the, the, how do you achieve that balance between doing what's right from a public health standpoint and you know, maintaining what we need, which is social interaction. We're, we're social beings. Well, you know, it's interesting because we, we all have, we all negotiate those dynamics differently in our relationships. And, you know, I remember my grandparents, you know, they lived, uh, they had, when, from the time I could remember them, they had separate bedrooms. Um, and it was kind of the norm back then for people age 50 and above, they like had separate bedrooms um where, where i grew up anyway uh but <clears throat> which I, you know growing up and having that normalized it didn't seem that strange but um i think yeah i mean it depends on the dynamic of the relationship but there's social distancing and then there's going to the to the point of um creating fear right so Last night, I was even watching a video on YouTube. It was a doctor, a medical doctor, who was talking about exactly how COVID-19 works in the body, which also can be anxiety producing. So I don't advocate for people to go watch all of that unless mm -hmm. you are not affected by hearing about the medical uh, process. Um, but one of the things he mentioned was like that people can get it from kissing. So I'm assuming that couples are feeling um, scared even to kiss each other and uh, the thing to know though is if you're in the same family most likely you all have the same germs already anyway right you're touching the same surfaces you're uh, in the same space and for most people in the country they don't have the space within their home to social distance mm -hmm. um, crowding itself has always been a factor in terms of uh, one's mental wellness. And so, you know, it's important to be realistic about the fear that one has around whether, how far they need to social distance from their own family members. Uh, now, if somebody is in a full blown, um, or, the, you know, diagnosis of having the COVID-19, they quarantine themselves even from their family within the home. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, it's pretty safe to say that you're all sharing the same germs anyway. So maybe not social distance so much. <laughs> right, I agree with that. Uh, in the upcoming, here's a question from Iman and everybody please uh, start asking your questions. This is the, uh, an opportunity that we have with Dr. Heather Laird Jackson. So go ahead and type your questions in the chat space. Uh, Iman asks, in the upcoming months when Corona will inshallah be less stressful, what are resources, methods you recommend to cope with the trauma some of us are having felt during this quarantine and time of financial instability? So that now dealing with the reactions to the crisis and, and not the virus uh, itself, but, but some of the repercussions of it. So in terms of policies, you know, financial policies, I'm not the I'm not the, you're, you're probably more versed, you know, better versed in that salon than I am in terms of policy. What I can say around mental health is that even mental health has an intersectionality there with policy and primarily in the, in healthcare. Um, mental health is not always covered by insurance. And when it is covered by insurance, it's not covered usually very well. Um, there are very few insurances that really do a good job of covering mental health um, coverage. And as such, one of the first things that goes when people start to feel that financial crunch is going to see the therapist, if they go at all, right? Because it's like an extra expense that they just can't afford, um, which is tragic. I mean, that's something that we need to advocate for as a community for better health care, for better mental health care. Uh, in terms of the financial coverage of it, because when people are not able, 
issues. There are issues that you can't really discuss within your family, right? There are issues that come up about yourself as an individual, um, and it helps to traditionally, in our traditional communities, we solve that problem by having aunties and uncles um, that would be that structural support for our nuclear family to give that release and that relief of pressure. But as dislocation became apparent you know a lot of immigrant families don't have extended family here but also within the united states uh, those born within the united states a lot of dislocation happened back in the 70s and 80s because of the job you know market and economy so nuclear families don't live near each other anymore and so that whole idea of having aunties and uncles to relieve that pressure you know uh, was affected greatly and so now what we have um, are some people trying to create what they call a family of choice, where they try to choose people that have similar values to have their children around as aunties and uncles. But apart from that, you have therapists, right? You have your imams um, and your religious leadership to try to relieve some of that pressure. Uh, and so, it's, it's perfectly normal to want to have that private conversation with a therapist or an imam or somebody outside of your family. What we need to do is, are, is to have the resources to support it. Now, I know um, in our own community in LA, uh, we do have a program at the mosque to try to help people um, where they can make appointments through the mosque to get mental health services that are offered on a sliding scale fee and you know we are working to fundraise um, a little bit of money for to offset the cost of those people that can't afford it um, in fact next month we're launching a campaign or an annual campaign of you know one million standing strong where we ask people to donate a dollar each to toward the cause of mental health um, but I'm not sure if I answered their question or not, but I hope I did. No, I think you did, yeah. Uh, but it, it, it takes us to a bigger discussion about uh, capacity for mental health in our community and in our society and how it's not part of the budget. It's not part of, as you said, you can't use your insurance for that. Is there something we need to be advocating for now uh, as part of these emergency relief that mental health should be uh, included? Absolutely, because even our first responders even myself, right? Like if I don't do self care, because I'm hearing a lot of the grief that people are having. Um, the other night, one, one of the things I did for self care is I watched a movie um, called The Vow. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie before, um, but I just, uh, it's a tearjerker. And I, I, I literally cried after watching this movie. And it was, it was a, a good thing for me to do because I have absorbed so much grief lately. Um, and tears are a mercy from Allah. Uh, they literally take toxins out of the body. When those tears come out of your, your body, it literally takes toxins out of your body. Just like when you're sweating, when you're working out, those tears take toxins out. So um, it's important that we are able to do that self-care because our first responders, they need self-care too. Yeah. They're dealing with all that stress. Um, so the University of San Francisco set up a line to intake first responders. Uh, so they set up a line where mental health professionals have donated their time to talk to first responders. Um, and then we, our center has set up a line as well, a warm line to talk to people who, you know, just maybe want to talk for 10 minutes to reduce their anxiety or 30 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. We have licensed mental health uh, care professionals who man the line from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, West Coast time. And um, it's, just a, it's just to try to be a help, it's a free service. Uh, additionally, I can tell you that um, SAMHSA uh, is, has a distress hotline. Let me give you that number real quick. It's 1-800-985-5990. And LA County also has a 24-7 helpline, which is 1-800-854-7771. And the great thing about that county helpline is that it has many different language case, uh, capacities. Um, so uh, it, it, it's good for a lot of people that 
can't speak English, for example. Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think we need to deal with the trauma that our first responders, and right now they are our physicians, our nurses, our uh, hospital workers. They're probably dealing with a lot of trauma and they need to be counseled uh, along with the families that are dealing with. Uh, they are because they, they take an oath, right? To do no yeah. harm, just as we do as mental health professionals. And they are, ha they are being forced to make decisions about things that they never saw coming. Um, for example, being put in a position whereby they typically are, I mean, the United States has always been a country that is on the forefront of, of many different um, pieces in society, but one of them has been medicine. And so they're used to having all of the needs that they, all the resources they need to treat a patient. And now not only do they not have all the needs uh, met uh, for resources, but they also um, don't have enough uh, resources for themselves to be mm -hmm. safe. And so they find themselves do compromising the care by saying things like, I may not be, I may, I'm going to go in the room and give the treatment that's needed, but then I'm not going to stay with the patient because I could catch this virus myself. And there's a huge question in there because what happens when our medical professionals also become sick and all that intelligentsia is gone, right? What happens to us then as a population? Um, there, there is a lot here to advocate for and to preserve. Uh, that's not, it's not being done um, seemingly well at the federal level, I would say. No, we're ill prepared, um, right. But um, I, I do appreciate how a lot of different governors I've seen really advocating for their people, a lot of mayors also advocating for their people. But this is a time that really brings home as well the fact that we as human beings and as a society have limitations. Mm -hmm. And so like also being able to sit with those limits uh, another question I get a lot is, what do you do in terms of domestic violence? That's another repercussion that goes unnoticed, especially in this time when you don't have some of these services available to you. Um, have you dealt with cases of domestic violence? And can you share some of the observations and lessons uh, for us in terms of what we can do? I mean, number one, get, get professional help. But, but other than that, what else should we be um, looking out for and, 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 and being helpful in those situations? So to be honest with you, domestic violence is one of those areas where I have a no tolerance policy. Um, when somebody is reaching the point in their relationship where it has become violent, uh, one person needs to leave the situation um, and take shelter with a family member or um, if, if they don't have that, we do have, um, certainly in SoCal, we have a couple of good options. We have the Niswa Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, they have been helping people for many years, um, very confidential. They specialize in this. And so that's, I would, I would recommend people go there first because they, this is their specialty as well. Um, uh, equally well, ICNA Relief in Orange mm -hmm. County, they actually have transitional housing for, for women. Um, so if a woman is experiencing a domestic violent, um, exp you know, experience with her spouse uh, to go to, to the ICNA Relief um, transitional housing for domestic violence, that, which is located in Orange County. These are two really good resources. Uh, but, but even before that, like let's say you're in the moment and you're unexpected, it's, it happens unexpectedly, you don't even worry about who you're gonna call for resources, just leave, right? Somebody needs to leave the room, leave the house, get out, you know, let things diffuse. Uh, staying and trying to de-escalate somebody when they're angry just really doesn't work. Um, for even for a mental health professional, there's a, there are limits to de-escalation, right? What happens when somebody's angry is that their brain shuts down. Right. 
and nothing that you say rationally gets in there because it's closed. And so, uh, because this, this front part of our brain, which is responsible for executive thinking and functioning, it shuts down and we go back to this more basic part of our brain that's considered more the reptilian, the basic drives and needs when we're angry. And so all of that complex thinking is out the window. So when you're dealing with somebody like that, you just need to get away from them. Once you get out of the environment, you can call anybody you need to call, whether it's 911, whether it's you know a family member, whether it's um, a shelter. The, the biggest point is whether you're male or female being abused, because we do also have, uh, in, within our community, men who have been abused by their wives. So, you know, just get out and then, you know, seek those resources. Um, there's, you know, oftentimes not enough time. We'd rather have you alive, you know, and, and, and struggling than to have you not alive at all. What are we doing to train our imams to deal with these situations in a more effective manner as opposed to the past where they just said, well, um, they, either they're not trained or they were actually part of the problem? So this is a good question. I think that it's something that we need to look at and having in a real sustainable way. Um, a few years ago, Sheikh Suhail Mullah and I trained a lot of people in Southern California through a behavioral health training. Um, and it, it was a really great experience because a lot of the religious leaders that we trained felt relief that they had somewhere to refer cases that they really didn't know how to address, but also relief in that they don't have to deal with this alone. If they're not trained for it, they don't have to take it on. Um, but also that they can get enough training to recognize this is beyond my scope of practice as an imam or religious leader. Um, that happened, like I said, a few years ago. Um, and I know across the country there are similar programs happening, but to be honest with you, it needs to be something that is more sustainable, something that we do more often, more frequently, uh, because people change, you know, in terms of who's in the leadership. So. Uh, we do need to have that uh, again, probably. Uh, we have time for just one last question. Um, question comes from Lori asking, how do we deal with people who are suffering from depression and trying to help them achieve uh, a sense of ease? So this is a great question because um, it really depends on where they are with their depressive symptoms. Uh, so with depression, we have mild depression, moderate depression, and severe depression. With mild depression, there are some people that even argue with everything that's going on in our world right now that it's just smart to have a little bit of depression um, because the world it, right now is suffering. Um, so to have depression, <clears throat> every emotion that we have has positive and negative qualities. And just like everything else, too much of anything is not a good thing, right? So too much happiness usually leads to what we call mania or euphoria. And that also is a, is a sign of a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, we don't want too much of that. We also don't want too much sadness. Um, a little bit of sadness might actually fit the situation. So we have situational depression, that's normal. What we want to do is teach people how to sit with those feelings and be okay with them, right? Normalize the fact that, you know, something bad happened and you feel sad about it. That's pretty normal and actually a good thing that you do feel sad about it because we wouldn't want you to feel nothing about it. Um, we don't want you numbing your feelings. Your feelings are a blessing from Allah to help you navigate uh, this world. It, there are signs that they give your intuition clues about how to take next steps. So when it gets to the point of what we would call uh, moderate depression, where you're um, not able to keep in your same routine, you can't get out of bed in the morning to go to work or school, those kind of um, signs and symptoms, then that's what we need to get help, right? Um, at that stage, we can be more preventive and you can, you can get help either through um, talk therapy or you can get help through 
uh, seeking possible medications for help. But the medications, the whole point of the psychopharmacology around depression is that the medications are supposed to give a boost to uh, doing regular therapy, right? So the same uh, effect that a, a antidepressant, for example, has on the brain, you can achieve with psychotherapy within six months. So the idea is that the two will cross paths after about six months. And then the uh, psychopharmacology becomes less effective and the talk therapy continues to rise in terms of its effectiveness. Uh, so at that stage, at that moderate stage, we do want to start seeking help. And then if it gets too severe, we're looking at things like suicidal ideation. If it, if it gets to that point, if somebody's talking about wanting to hurt themselves or they have a plan, if they have a plan, you, you, you really want to get others involved, uh, whether it be a therapist or we have, in most counties, we have, it has different names. So like it's in LA County, it's called the PET team, the Psychiatric Emergency Team. In um, Orange County, I think it's called the CAT team. It's, it has different uh, animal names uh, in these different co counties. Um, but they, these are teams of social workers or licensed mental health care, care professionals, along with law, I mean, law enforcement is involved uh, somehow, uh, but they come to assist and evaluate if the person needs to be uh, taken for observation. Right, so it's meant that it's meant to be a social service for the public to be helpful, not not harmful. So, if they want to get in touch with uh, you or Center for Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology, how how can they contact you? So they can <clears throat> contact us through our uh, phone number. It's four two four three five four eight zero nine five. Or they can contact me on email, which is cmmhip director at gmail.com. Uh, we currently have other, you know, um, mental health professionals within the center. We have men and women. Um, we have the language capacity of Urdu, Spanish, and Arabic right now. Um, and we have offices both in Southern California and then, as you know, in Rockville, Maryland. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Heather Laird Jackson. I uh, really appreciate your expertise and your commitment. And uh, I believe you're doing a session uh, either today or tomorrow at the Islamic Center or, or one of our mosques uh, where we can also watch. On uh, Sunday. Uh, on Sunday. Inshallah. And uh, one of the main lessons I got is you need a good laugh and you need a good cry uh as well you, know, you need to eat well you need to exercise ma maintain that routine you know um. eating is not a problem for me so <laughs> got that covered <laughs> we're doing a lot of eating in our time uh here at home but uh, and, and it's actually good we're we're doing more creative uh uh not experiments but we're doing you know doing different dishes and things that we haven't made for a while so you know cooking as a couple is wonderful yeah yeah, uh, it's a great activity good. to do together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the silver linings. But thank you very much for your time, and thank you everyone for joining us. Remember, we're doing this uh, as part of uh, the from the support of the community. So we ask you to continue to support this and other programs of the Muslim Public Affairs Council that is trying to enhance public understanding and improve public policies impacting American Muslims. Thank you very much. On Monday, we're going to be talking to Mansoor. Uh, Khadr of the D Democratic National Committee, and, and we'll be talking about what's going to happen to the elections in light of the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis um, and uh, where, where we're going to be headed in terms of the November elections. Thank you, Heather. Good seeing you again. Do Thank you. Allah well, protect all of us, inshallah, and protect inshallah. you and impact, inshallah. And thank you uh, for your continued leadership and impact to offer these kind of events. It's really wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. My, my servant, my honor. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.